here. Can you all hear me fine? It's nice to not be hidden by the uh, podium. Um, I understand that the whole purpose of this is for you to get to know the people who are at the Mind Institute rather than just the research. So I want to tell you a little bit about kind of who I am and who my colleague is, who's going to be sharing. But I also want to know who you are, because you folks are also the minds behind the mind. The mind was conceived as a community liaison, parents and university. And so the families are very much part of the minds behind the mind. So I'd like to know how many of you are parents of children with autism? OK, great. And how many of you are uh, teachers or therapists for children with autism? Great. And how many of you are students? OK. And physicians or medical um, people who provide medical care? Great. Researchers? Oh, good. <laughs> what a refreshing change. <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK. And so who all did I miss? Who, el who else is here? Hmm? Grandparents. OK, family members. I'll broaden it. Family members of children with autism. OK, and uh, who else did I miss? Nobody? That's every single person? Yes? Great. I'm glad to have you here. All right, well, that's wonderful. It's a very nice mixed audience. And of the um, people who are therapists, how many of you are speech therapists? Great, great contingency. OTs, physical therapists, special educators, including early childhood, regular educators, social workers, no social workers, psychologists, uh, behavior analysts, marriage and family therapists, excellent. Now who did I forget? <laughs> Music therapists, excellent. I'm batting a 1,000 here. OK, so as you can see, it's a really nice mixed group of people. Um, I, I came to the Mind Institute from Colorado, where I'd been working in autism for a long, long time. And I came here because of the enormous potential that it seemed the Mind Institute was offering, that the chance to come. I'm a developmental psychologist, and um, I'm licensed as a clinical psychologist in California and in Colorado, and I've, I've, take, I've studied children's development and children's behavior in autism and in a number of different disorders. And I've worked closely with families, but I'm really in that kind of behavior developmental realm. And so the opportunity to come to a place where I could work side by side with brain researchers like Dr. Amaral, who's here, and um, people who study the genomes, the genetics of autism, the um, people who can do electroencephalography and that kind of processing of autism, people who could look at psychophysiological process, to be able to work side by side with that team and to not have to convince everybody that autism was really interesting and that they should come and join us in autism study, to not have to keep twisting people's arms to get them into autism research. It seemed like it would be like heaven on earth for somebody like me. And so, um, and I have not been disappointed. It's been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for me to be here and to work. I have a colleague we're doing, uh, in addition to the behavioral and developmental studies that I'm doing, we are doing eye tracking in our labs. We've got several p young people who have come, and so we're looking at gaze patterns in children with autism. We are, I'm collaborating with a study on EEG, um, monitoring of mirror neurons and imitation in autism. We're um, working on EMG and psychophysiological responses to sensory, um, sensory uh, stimuli in a couple of studies that, we're, that I'm engaged in. And uh, the child, little children in our infant studies, we're, um, the parents are helping us to gather blood samples so we can look at genomic patterns in those studies. So these are the kinds of opportunities that are just incredible. And I feel really lucky to be here. And uh, I've been here now four and a half years, almost five. And in the time we've been here, we have one of the CPEA networks. I don't know if you know that it is. It's one of the large funded networks from NIH. And that's in its last year now. And we've been doing a set of studies on imitation and regression. And we have some very interesting findings on regression, which we'll share with you at another time. And there's another large study on development of autism from infancy on. And we're currently analyzing our data on one month olds. Sally Oz and I often I will give a talk on that this summer for, for you in this series. Because we've been studying babies now from the time of birth to age 
three, and we also have this group of children that we have um, reconstructed their infancies from their infant videotapes to look at their patterns of onset, uh, to compare children who have regression to those with, with early onset patterns. And that whole line of work is so fascinating to me in terms of how autism unfolds over the first few years of life. So that's another set of studies I'm involved in, and we'll share those with you, I think, this summer, John got us to agree to come back. But tonight, we're, what I'm going to share with you um, are the works, is the work that we're doing in early intervention. And this is very exciting for me. I'd been doing early intervention in Colorado for many, many, many years. And when I came here, you know, that's not something that you just walk into a door and start the next day. It takes really developing a team and kind of getting the lay of the land. What makes sense to do here in Sacramento, where there's so many good services already for young children with autism? What are the questions in this community that um, need answering? What are the things that this community could benefit from in terms of early intervention? It's really different. This is a very different environment in terms of intervention than Colorado. So it took a few years for me to kind of get here and get to know who is here, who's doing what, what are the interventions that are well represented, how do families get into them? And also took me a while to find colleagues to work with. But I'm a very lucky person. Two years ago, a wonderful young woman joined our team. Her name is Lori Vismara. You might know the Vismara name. Um, there's um, a, a lot of help for autism in Lori and her family. And Lori came very well trained from the Kegel Lab and trained in, from Santa Barbara in PRT. And she came here to do postdoctoral research. And so she um, convinced me how good it would be for us to get going in early intervention studies again here. And so the combination of work I'm doing with Lori and work that I'm doing with Jerry Dawson in Seattle is what we're going to be talking with you about tonight. But I want to introduce her. Come on up, Lori. She's, uh, she's uh, one of the bright lights of the Mind Institute. And you know, as much as we're into research, we're really into training. We really need to create the next generation of autism researchers. We need them to know a whole lot more than what my generation knows in a lot more areas. And Lori's one of the people who's going to be that next generation of well-published and well-funded and autism researchers who are um, helping us do tremendous things with kids with autism. So why don't you tell people about yourself a little, Lori? Uh, well, thank you. I'm so pleased to be talking here to you today and to be showing you the project that we're currently doing with uh, toddlers and, and infants with autism. Um, as Sally mentioned, I received my degree in educational psychology from UC Santa Barbara. I worked there with Robert and Lynn Cagle, uh, learning the intervention approach pivotal response training. And I had the pleasure to work with so many families and their children, uh, both in the homes and the school settings. Um, you know, wherever the families wanted to work, we, um, we used those intervention strategies to improve the children's behaviors across a wide array of different functioning areas uh, to really address the family's needs. So to think of not just what the, the child needs or what the parent needs, but what that whole structure, that whole unit needs to really to function as a whole. Um, so I, let's see, and then on a personal note, um, as Sally alluded to, um, I have a younger brother with autism. So, you know, I'm in this, I'm invested in, in autism not only as a researcher as a, and as a clinician and therapist, but also as a family member. I understand the struggles, at least from a sibling perspective, what families go through from the time that you know, they, they hear the news of the diagnosis to trying to find what is a, a good fit, what's a good intervention fit for them, and what's going to really help their child and help them and make them feel whole again. So I'm so pleased to be here. Again, I'm just so excited to share our work with you, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. OK, so we're going to talk a little bit about the kind of lines of how we understand the field of early intervention in autism right now and what um, kind of where the field has taken us in the lines of research that we're doing. And we'll tell you a little bit about two studies that we're currently involved in. And we'll also tell you about some studies that are on the planning board um, for kind of the next few years of intervention work. But um, let's talk a little bit about kind of what we're thinking about and how we got to where we are right now and where that is. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of how we understand the different currents that are going on in early intervention right now for young children with autism. We'll talk about some of the evidence. This is not going to be a dry talk, but we'll talk about a little bit of the evidence behind the interventions because one of the things that California families and practitioners are very aware of is the empirical evidence, the question of evidence. And I think it's one of the strengths of California 
the amount of education that's gone on about the importance of looking at evidence behind interventions and not just the hype about them. And then as we said, we'll talk about studies we're currently involved in and studies that we're planning. And um, this is a busy slide, <laughs> but it basically, it, we have a very nice summary document that was published a few years ago by the National Research Council in 2001. And it involved um, a large group of experts in early intervention who were distilling the research at the time to try to help us come up with what are the most important things that any good early intervention program needs to handle. And they talked about the importance of focusing very strongly on communication, spontaneous communication, and on generalization and maintenance of skills that are learned not just learning, but using, being able to use those skills in many different situations and with many people. They also provided, I think, that one of the most solid set of recommendations for what should be in any young child's program. And this includes at least 25 hours a week of intervention, 12 months a year, um, a, a, an intervention that's designed and overseen by a multidisciplinary team, the importance of involving the family, the importance of a systematic plan for delivery of that intervention and ongoing data collection and correction of the program to assure ongoing change. If you don't know this document, especially family members, this is a very useful way, I think, of gauging how, um, how the program that your children are in stacks up against what we currently have as the, kind of the best standard, best practice right now. now um, it seems to me like the interventions that um, we all know about in the U.S. can kind of uh, fall into three basic kind of uh, uh, groups, two of which are based on applied behavior analysis, and the third group, which is not, which is based on de developmental theories uh, from developmental literature uh, in involving children. And um, I want to talk a little bit about this, because I think one of the things, Californians are very sophisticated around applied behavior analysis. Um, but I think there's also a tendency to, to see discrete trial teaching or LOVAS's approach to this as the definition of applied behavior analysis, and it's not. It's one way of using applied behavior analysis to develop programs. And I think it's important to understand the breadth of ways that people can apply the principles of, of ABA to develop, children's, uh, to develop interventions for children. So as I kind of look at all of these projects, and have, I've had to write a couple of papers where I've had to review all this literature. And so you know when you write a paper, you have to have an outline. You have to have some way to make sense of, of all of these studies. So for me, clustering them in these three ways makes some sense. And let's start with, um, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna start talking about the didactic approach uh, within which we use the principle poles of applied behavior analysis. And as you know, applied behavior analysis is, involves the science of learning. It comes from lab-based studies. It, uh, it, it examines the relationship, its operant learning um, from Skinner's work in the 50s, looks at the relationship of antecedents, behaviors, and consequences, and how behavior repertoires are changed by the um, behavioral responses to antecedents and the consequences of those behavioral responses. The principles of those are analyzing, as you well know, the relationships between the antecedents and behaviors and behaviors and consequences. And the main teaching techniques that are used inside that tradition are four, prompting, chaining, fading, and shaping. Do I need to define those for anybody in the room? Okay, so in prompting, we're talking about how to elicit the behavior in the presence of the antecedent in order to apply the consequence. I'm gonna talk about positive strategies right now. So prompting for a child that you're teaching to sit down would be to give the instruction and then to help them sit down. Helping them sit in the presence of the antecedent, which is the instruction, is the prompt. So it's a way of using an additional help or cue to the child to get the behavior that you want to teach present so that you have something to reinforce. Fading involves getting rid of those prompts <laughs> once you have them and once you have the behavior um, that's being, um, that's present, then you want to fade those prompts back so that the behavior is really uh, uh, present in response to the antecedent and not to the prompt. Shaping means taking, starting, getting a behavior going in a kind of a rough form um, and shaping it up over time. Speech is a great example of this. So 
in teaching a young child to say a word, you might have a child who can make a ba ba ba, and we decide we're going to use that as an approximation of the word ball. And so when we bring out a ball and the little child wants that ball, we get, can get the ba ba ba, and when you first get it, we'll hand them the ball, we'll reinforce it, because that's the best approximation that child can make right now for the ball word. But over time, we're going to start requiring that child to produce a, more, a word that sounds more like ball in order to get it. We're going to get those extra syllables out of there and start just getting a ba, and then we're going to get into the ball, and we're going to slowly shape that production over time to get closer and closer to the level that we want to see it. And the fourth one, fading, shaping, chaining, involves a behavior, a, a skill that we want a child to learn that has many steps to it, like going to the bathroom or taking your clothes off or eating appropriately at the table has many steps to it. And each one of those steps becomes a behavior in an ABC chain. And we have to teach each of those behaviors. And we want to teach them in a flow, kind of, so that that skill, all the behaviors are represented. So we, we chain those behaviors together in the sequence. We may have the child help them with each step so that we can create this flow, make a chain, behavior, 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 and then start helping those behaviors link to each other. That's the process of chaining to teach um, a complex skill. And generally, we, we may support the child through many of the steps and teach the final one or the first one. And then when one step is mastered, we start dropping uh, help for the other steps. Does that help? OK. So those are the main teaching techniques that we see in any ABA approach. Um, but these, uh, in our country, applied behavior analysis is applied in two kind, kind of fairly different ways. If you, when you see the samples of these behaviors, they're gonna, the teaching's going to look really diff different to you even though that the underlying principles and teaching strategies are the same. Um, one way of using applied behavior analysis is in a kind of a mass trial way in which the adult has a lot of control over the teaching episode. The child is, is kind of a in the respondent mode. The adult is in the active instructional mode. And the adult gets such behavior that they want and practices it many times in a row which um, we can call mass trials. A lot of trials are practiced at a time because, you know, we learn new skills through practice. And children require as many episodes of practice as they need to get a skill in their repertoire. So in mass trial teaching, we see an active adult who chooses the materials, who chooses the lesson, who selects the reinforcer based on how much the child wants it, um, regardless of kind of what it is or what relationship it has to the lesson that's being taught. The adult decides what level of response is going to get that reinforcement, decides ahead of time, and then masses those trials initially till we get a certain level of learning, and then starts thinning trials and requiring more advanced um, production, more spontaneous production, et cetera. So um, that's kind of the bare bones of mass trial approach, or more didactic approach, and the LOVAS approach is a very, very strong example of this. The similar kind of teaching is used in the Princeton program and in many of the uh, strong behavioral programs that have been uh, present for a long time. The very first case study that was ever done, uh, talking about intervention for a child with autism, um, used these methods. That paper was written in 1964, and it described this kind of teaching. And it's very interesting to go back and read that paper and see that the same lessons and same approaches are still being taught today and for thousands of children in this country. OK. Here's an example of what this kind of teaching looks like. This little boy is reviewing skills that he's learned. These are on maintenance. And she has run through the, running through these. You can see the adult is very much in control. There's the reinforcer. Let me see if there's, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I think if there's anything Sacramento knows, it's this kind of teaching. OK, that wasn't, that wasn't a criticism. It's just it is well represented here. I wish there was more of this kind of teaching in Denver, because uh, it's a very effective approach to teaching a lot of skills. As you probably know, the, um, there's been a lot of research. This method has been more, better studied than any other single teaching approach 
in on the literature, I believe. Um, and uh, Lovas did us all a great service in, when he published his paper in 1987, talking about the level of change that the children he'd been treating had um, made in the three to five years that they'd been receiving this kind of treatment. Before Lovas's 87 paper, in which he talked about I, an average IQ gain of about 25, is yeah. it up there, Lori? No, but it's your right. About 25 points. These are Lori's slides, not mine, and so uh, I haven't actually uh, rehearsed with them yet. But he talked about IQ, a mean IQ gain of 25 points, a number of children, almost half the children in this study, no longer needing special education, being in regular classrooms by age eight, having all their standardized scores in the normal range, not being on an IEP, essentially functioning without any special services and without a diagnosis as far as we know. Um, this was mind-boggling. Mind no one had ever talked about this kind of outcome being possible before. And in that paper and the replications and the follow-up of those children, he raised the bar enormously for what we should expect from early intervention, what we should be delivering from early intervention, and what's possible in autism. And um, I think we all owe him a tremendous, um, we're all indebted to him tremendously for raising our expectations and our goals and telling us what we can shoot for for some children and how high we want to shoot for all children. So the, um, this, this study had a control group, but this was not a randomized design. And so one of the first questions, as you all know from your basic intro to psychology courses in college was, you know, finding isn't a finding until more than one person has found it. You know, can, can the finding be replicated? Can other people do this in other labs? Is this really a solid scientific fact? And with the publication of this work, that was the next question. Can it be replicated? How solid is this finding? And is recovery possible? The, um, the strongest study that we have in terms of scientific design of the LOVAS approach was carried out by Tris Smith, who's now a professor in the University of Rochester and is very active still in early intervention in the country and in research. He improved on the methods that LOVAS used in terms of the research design in several ways. He used a randomized control group. And what that means is that um, when, you, when children uh, volunteered and families volunteered for the study, in the Smith study, he randomly assigned children to either a treatment group or a comparison group. And so the same pool of children is going into, the, into those two groups, which, which helps you make sure that the comparison group is really a similar set of children to the experimental group. If you don't use random assignment, if you're really accruing the comparison children in a different way, you don't know to what, how much they're really the same, even if their IQ scores are the same. So randomized design is considered the strongest scientific design for an intervention study, whether we're talking about a sleep medication or an intervention in autism. And Tris did that. He had randomized groups. He used a large, a large number of children. Um, he used a very uniform assessment package, which was an improvement over Lovas' work. He also was, this is a recent enough study that he could use the same diagnostic practices and labels that we use now. He, did, he could um, divide the children into those children who met all criteria for autistic disorder or those who didn't meet all the criteria and so were diagnosed with PDD-NOS. Um, uh, Lovas couldn't do that because we didn't have the diagnostic, we didn't have those diagnoses at the time and we didn't have the diagnostic capacity to do that. Tris also documented all the, the treatment hours that were delivered for these children. The goal was to deliver 35 hours a week, but the children actually ended up getting 25 hours a week due to illness and vacations and student schedules and all those things that get in the way of a home-based treatment. Smith um, replicated Lovas's findings of, of a significant difference in IQ in the treated children compared to the children who were in the comparison group, an IQ difference of 20-some points. Um, the uh, ch treated children also had uh, increased scores compared to the other children, but those did not reach statistical significance. And so the only, the only scores in which there was a, a significant difference was in IQ. Um, 
But in other ways, his results didn't replicate Dr. Lovas's. First of all, none of the children in this study recovered or met the, that that, those set of characteristics of best outcomes that Dr. Lovas described. Um, he didn't, uh, many of the children still were in special education. He didn't have as high a final IQ in his study as Dr. Lovas did, but the initial IQ was also lower. So both groups of children gained 20 to 25 <laughs> points. But in the Smith study, the children started with a mean IQ of around 45 and ended up with a mean IQ of around 70 or so, 65 maybe. Where in the Lovas study, the, initial, the final <coughs> IQ was about 87, and the initial IQ was probably more like 60. So these are two different set of children coming into this study, with the children in the Smith study being more severely involved in the beginning and not having that strong, uh, that strong an outcome at the end, but still making very significant gains. One thing that was very important uh, for us to see in this study was the difference between the, the gains of the children who had a diagnosis of autism and those with PDD and OS. And I think this is an important caution when we look at this, um, this treatment. This shows you on that side the children who were diagnosed with full-fledged autism, and on this side, the children who were diagnosed with PDD-NOS, which means they didn't meet all criteria for autism. If you look at the bars in terms of IQ, the blue is the pretest and the red is the post-test after they've been treated for three years, I believe. And you can see that the children who have full autistic disorder make almost no gains as a group. Now, that doesn't mean that none of the children in that group made gains. Some made gains and some probably lost skills. But overall, when you put all 14 of those children together, the um, there's really no difference in the pre and post scores in the children. All the difference is in the children who have the PDD and OS diagnosis, who make massive different gains in IQ and larger differences in language scale, uh, scores than did the children with autism. And this fits many other things we know in, in the autism literature in terms of children with PDD and OS generally having higher IQs at the beginning. Um, having higher IQs at the end, having milder symptoms, although in this study, these children did not have higher IQs at the beginning. So it's, interest, it's interesting to see this, and this is one of the only studies that's really done this, looked at the um, gains of these two diagnostic groups differently. Okay. Um, we're not going to, uh, there have been other replications as well uh, of the LOBOS technique, including a recent one from California um, by Howard Cohen and the group down in Central Valley Regional Center. They've just published a replication, not using a randomized control, but using comparison groups and showing just as good outcomes as Dr. LOBOS reported. Lots of children making 20 to 25 point gains, a number of children in that best outcome group. Other groups who've used other kinds of didactic um, <coughs> behavioral approaches are also showing some similar findings. So certainly I think this, it has been replicated several times now that people can get IQ get changes in a group of 20 to 25 points and can get that mean IQ up out of the range of mental retardation in a group of children who get this kind of treatment delivered by experts in expert settings for 30 to 40 hours a week for three, I think all of these studies are three years or more. So in the hands of experts with the best we know how to do, half or so of a group of children can make this kind of gain. Okay. Um, let's skip ahead now and let's shift to another way of using applied behavior analysis to create early intervention programs. And I'm gonna hand this over to Lori because this is her area of expertise. So this is a very different type of interaction then that happens between the child and the adult um, when we're talking about naturalistic behavioral approaches. And in this sense, it's, there's, there's a much more facilitative interaction style uh, where the teaching episodes, they're initiated by the child's behavior for, the, uh, for requests um, for preferred items, for items that the child um, finds interesting, that they're motivated by, that they prefer. That can be acti activities, objects, uh, and that these items then, that the teaching then revolves, takes place in the context of these ongoing activities 
revolved around the child's interest. And access to those items then serve as the, the rewards or the reinforcer. So there's this intrinsic, um, there's the use of, of intrinsic reinforcers, meaning that there's this direct relationship between the child's behavior and the item that the teaching um, episode revolves around. Uh, the focus is really on building spontaneous, sp spontaneity in their language, having it be flexible and, and meaningful and functional across a variety of different activities in different social contexts and with, uh, with, with several different well, social partners, whether that be adults or peers, and on um, having there be continuous engagement between the child and the adult. So the child really takes on a much more active role than the respondent role that we see with the didactic uh, behavioral approaches. One such example of the naturalistic behavioral approach is pivotal response training. Uh, this was developed, as I mentioned, by Robert and Lynn Cagle at UC Santa Barbara and their colleague Laura Schreiben at UC San Diego. Um, they've been doing research in the area of PRT spanning back for 30 years, um, and so really just publishing some tremendous research showing the effects that, that, these, um, that this approach has for children and their families. <laughs> the teaching strategies are similar. Uh, in terms of fitting those, uh, the principles of a naturalistic approach in the sense that the adult, uh, well, that you're using child preferred items, again, as the basis for, your, for that teaching episode, that those are the, the materials or the stimuli that you're using. Um, the adult presents very clear instructions, very short, concise words or, um, or prompts to the child. Again, you're using intrinsic rewards, um, naturally occurring consequences to what the activity is um, and related, again, around child preferred items. You're also the, another key component is that you're acknowledging or rewarding the child for making attempts. Um, Sally gave an example er earlier. If the child can't say ball, they might make a ba, 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 ba. That would be considered an attempt, and we'd want to reinforce that and accept that and give the child a ball for making that appropriate uh, production or, or vocalization. Another uh, strategy is that we're varying the types of activities that we're presenting with them. Um, we're, again, we're, we're kind of following the child to see what they're going to land on. If it's the ball and they, you know, we're going to do a game around the ball. And then they move to trains. We're going to then bring the teaching episode um, to the train and, and, and use that in a way where we're doing turn taking between the child and the adult to work on different skills, whether that's language or play. Um, so you're able to work on a variety of, of different skills by using that turn taking component. And to, to look and see what the child's doing, and then to elaborate and expand on that so that you can really target um, different areas. Lastly, you're interspersing, you're, you're providing teaching opportunities that allow the child to perform a task that they can already do. That's uh, referred to as a maintenance task. It's, it's within their repertoire. But then again, you're providing opportunities for them to, to, to go slightly above what their current functioning level is, and that's how learning takes place. But we make sure to, go, to alternate between those two types of teaching opportunities because we want to keep the child engaged with us and to stay in the activity and not to, to leave it. Um, the, the really the, the key to this approach to pivotal response training is in identifying behaviors that play a pivotal or central role in development, in the child's <laughs> development. And the idea is that when you, when you identify these behaviors um, and then address them and target them through the teaching strategies, you're going to see wi widespread positive changes across a variety of different functioning areas. So for example, one such area identified as pivotal for children, particularly at early communication stages, is their motivation, that their social tendency to approach and interact and respond to people and things in their environment. And what the research has shown is that when we use these teaching strategies of PRT to, to target motivation, to increase these children's tendency to, um, to approach an interaction and, and engage with an adult, we see dramatic increases, not only in their levels of motivation, but, across, but collateral gains across a variety of areas, including uh, ling language used in a spontaneous way where the child's initiating it. It's not dependent on a, on a prompt or a cue from the adult and they're able to engage in things like question asking and commenting. Uh, we also see that it affects all the different forms of language, increasing prepositions, um, art improving articulation, and then targeting other um, social communicative skills, such as joint attention, imitation, play skills. So really getting at these core areas that um, are impaired in autism. Uh, the research has shown, too, that these, these gains in social communicative areas, that they continue to occur um, over time and, again, in different to, um, in, in different activities and settings outside of that instructional um, 
or, or teaching episode where it occurred. So if it's happening in the clinic, it's also happening in the home, in the park, in school, um, when the parents, you know, taking the child on errands, wherever um, the child and the adult are, or even with peers, we see that these gains continue to occur. And because you're focusing on improving the child's motivation, you're not encountering these problems related to unwanted behaviors or resistance. Uh, the child is eager to learn. They, they enjoy the, the, um, the teaching episodes because it's based around their play. So those are the principles of PRT. Um, another area that's been examined is looking at this relationship between child characteristics and the effect it has on their treatment outcome. And specifically, this, is, this, is, this term is coined treatment mediators, this idea of what characteristics, behavioral characteristics, do we want children to have at the beginning of treatment that can, um, that can help them respond that can give them the most chance for responding well to that intervention program. And some research that's come out of um, the folks look, that, that are trained in PRT is that we see that positive outcomes from PRT are associated with children showing higher rates of social initiations at the beginning of intervention, um, less peer social avoidance, meaning that they're, they're interacting more with, with their peers, they're approaching, they're, they're maintaining interactions for longer periods of time, and also showing more toy play and stereotypic um, language, and then again, less social avoidance, that these have been really important predictors that we want children to see. Some of these researchers have gone on to then raise the question of whether or not these children, the children who do not show these behaviors can be taught them. For example, the Kegel, this Kegel article, um, they took a new group of children who were not show, making initiations, and they were successful in teaching them to, um, by using PRT to, to approach others, to, to engage in question asking, and that these children went on to show uh, similar favorable outcomes. So these, you know, if the child's not showing these skills, it doesn't mean that they're, that it's not, um, they're not teachable areas to them. But I think that this is an important area so that we can really, again, provide the right type of intervention to meet those child's needs, their characteristics, um, so that we can um, help just imp improve their outcome, their response to treatment. Okay, here's a video example um, of uh, PRT. Uh, this child, what you're going to see, um, I'm actually the therapist here working with him. His name is My Mikey. He's uh, two and a half here. And you're going to see me using, first of all, presenting different types of, of asking him to do different things. I'm going to be asking him to, um, to say checker, and you'll hear him making uh, approximations for that. Um, you'll see me also reinforcing him for making eye contact to me, to um, giving me a checker so that I can take a turn with it. So there's different things that I'm having him do, again, to keep him motivated, to keep his interest high. Um, I'm following his lead. I'm, I'm, this, this item was something that he wanted to play with. Um, so let me have a take a look at that. Oh, and this is, this is actually, he's actually a participant in the current study that we're going to be talking about, our, our toddler clinic study. Um, this is session, this is like maybe his third or fourth session, too, I should mention. And we'll get into the details of the project, but this basically means he's only had about four hours of therapy. And he was nonverbal non at the start of intervention, which means he had no functional words. <laughs> It's a white screen. <laughs> so yeah, he, he used no words consistently um, with the parents. He, um, they really described him as kind of just doing his own thing all day long. <laughs> no play skills. Um, he, bas he actually was, he st let's see, the longest he stayed with an activity was maybe 10 to 15 seconds. He would pretty much take out an activity, look at it for a few seconds, dump it, and go on to the next. And um, from our first, <laughs> treat, uh, first session that he came in, he was very good at making the room <laughs> like a, a bomb, <laughs> like a bomb went off, but that's OK. <laughs> yes. Yay. Yay. Open. his dad. My turn. And put black. Black. Yeah. Here, there's a checker for you. Oh, yeah. We put it here. Let's put it here. Let's put it here. Oh, there. Oh, yay! 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 back at his dad and Sally. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Black or red? Black. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Oh, oh black. Where's black? Black checker. Okay, my turn. I'm going to put checkers here. My turn. Bonus turn. Wanted him to just keep it as many as he could Yay! Yay! To be, Mikey. again, Mikey. rewarding things that I know that he could do so that he's going to stay with me longer so that the, ep the teaching episode can occur for a longer period of time so that I can then target more skills. Okay. So, let's see. Um, Okay, so we've gone, okay, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Sally. She's gonna discuss the developmental approach. Okay. The third class of uh, interventions that we're gonna talk about tonight briefly are the developmental approaches, and these are not based on applied behavior analysis. These are based on the science of child development. And underneath the developmental um, approach is the following. It's more focused on what's being taught uh, than on the procedures that are being used for teaching. And in a developmental approach, the, the kind of the framework for how children should progress is determined by patterns of normal development. So we're following, in a developmental approach, normal patterns of language acquisition, cognitive acquisition, play acquisition. And the curriculum essentially comes from study of normal children's development. In a, a developmental approach, uh, people usually use a fairly child-centered approach as well, in which child interests and child motivation carries a strong um, part in determining what's going to happen next. The focus is on interactions, on age-appropriate activities, and on following developmental sequences. Generally, I think developmental approaches are less focused on the kind of the precise teaching techniques, and they t often don't collect data as rigorously or in the same way as applied behavior analysis approaches. So you see differences. It may, on the surface, look the same, but there are underlying differences in the minds of the people who are delivering these and different value systems involved, although everybody is united in wanting children to move forward. Um, the, the differences in curriculum come out in, in, for instance, if we look at language, applied behavior analysis approach would look at the lack of language as a deficit and would say, okay, so we need to get words in here. The deficit is the child is not speaking any words, so we're gonna develop the vocal repertoire and shape it into speech. A developmentalist would look at a child who isn't speaking yet and say, well, this child isn't speaking, and where does speech come from? Speech comes from nonverbal communication. And where does nonverbal communication come from? That comes from early exchanges of gaze and smile. So the, the developmentalist would look at the child and start going back through the developmental communication to see where is this child in reference to how normal children develop language. And a developmentalist wouldn't start teaching speech to a nonverbal child who's not communicating with their body either or not understanding other people's bodies not producing sounds. They'd back way up and follow a developmental route rather than a task analysis route. So, so there really are differences, even though we all want to see children talking and playing and having the cognitive and motor skills that we need, that they need, there are different uh, ways that people choose their objectives, um, make decisions about what's, be, what's going to be taught and how it's going to be taught. Okay. So now we're going to shift into some of the work, I, I want to skip over that right now. We're going to shift into a cup on talking to you about some of the therapy uh, studies that we're doing right now in early intervention. And one of these, uh, well, both of them come from a model which uh, we now call the Early Start Denver model. And this comes from a, a fusion of a couple of approaches. The work that I did in Denver, which is a developmentally based approach to teaching young children with autism called the Denver model. And a fusion with the naturalistic applied behavior analysis techniques like PRT. 
Um, the Early Start Denver model actually grew out of a shared project that Jerry Dawson at the University of Washington and I are doing, um, which involves an intensive study of young, it's a randomized controlled trial of intensive interventions for very young children with autism um, using this approach as opposed to a didactic behavioral approach. And in and the model, this Early Start Denver model now is wh what all of our intervention studies are about. So we're going to tell you just a little bit about the principles, but it's actually what a part of what you've already seen it in Lori's tape. In the Early Start Denver model, we're fusing, we're fusing developmental and applied behavior analysis approaches. And so inside the teaching, we should be able to see these. There's really no reason that you shouldn't be able to fu fuse these. Um, because even in the behavioral literature, there are, there's a study, a very important study by a, a behavior analyst named Karen Lifter um, 10 years ago who looked at teaching play skills through applied behavior analysis. And she tried two different ways of teaching it. For, um, for the first and third child, she, ch she had developed the different de behavioral steps and she randomly chose what step to teach next. For the other two children, she followed the developmental sequence, starting with the, the easiest level that the child couldn't do and building up. And she used the same applied behavior techniques to teach all the children the skills that had been chosen for them. And what she found is that the only children who progressed were the children who were using a developmental curriculum to walk them into play. Those children made good progress. The children who were getting exactly the same kind of teaching with the same techniques but whose the skill level had been just picked randomly made no progress in the skills. So I think that paper was really important when I read that. That was a very important um, way of thinking about the use of how, where does our curriculum come from and where do our teaching techniques come from? And seeing that we could use developmental approaches to establish the content of intervention and, um, and, not, and continue to use careful teaching techniques and data strategies to bring the behavior analytic piece into it to support the most rapid te uh, learning and the most precise teaching. So, um, so those are two parts of what's going on here. And a third part, we haven't used the word relationship yet. Now we're going to start talking about relationships because the Denver model was always a, an intervention in which the quality of the relationship between the child and adult was a very important part of the therapy. And this comes again from a developmental approach to autism and early childhood development, that the difficulties children with autism have establishing relationships with other people, we think impairs their ability to imitate other people, understand what other people are talking about, understand the meaning of language, and to learn from them. And so we, we're always a very relationship-based model. It's interesting, PRT is also a model which fosters a very warm and positive relationship between the adult and the child, although PRT doesn't use the relationship language. So in the Early Start Denver model, we bring the, the, um, the concept of relationship right into this model and talk about how the therapist is establishing the relationship with this child in which what we want to see is a child who is happy, who's approaching, who wants to be interacting with the adult, who's continuing the interactions, and whose kind of state of energy and arousal is optimal for learning. So this quality of how the therapist is kind of in em emotional or affective connection with the child and what the child's emotional quality is in the therapy becomes a very important part of this therapy as well. So we have the importance of the relationship, the quality of the teaching, a developmental approach to all areas of um, development, and um, anything else, and, a, and a, a very careful data system. These become the highlights of the Early Start Denver model. We, uh, there's also a curriculum to go with it. In terms, this is one of the difficulties using PRT is that there isn't a specific curriculum. PRT is really a set of techniques that can be used with any, any kind of teaching approach in which there's an intrinsic reinforcer. But the Denver model's had a curriculum with it for years. And the curriculum covers nine different areas of child development, each of them in developmentally sequenced from about eight months of age to about four years of age. And these are the areas in which the uh, curriculum functions. For children who are getting an intensive uh, intervention, they have objectives written in nine developmental areas. And there are almost 500 items on this curriculum that are taught as part of the, uh, 
as the content of the intervention. In each case, the child is assessed in every area. The point in which they've mastered is, is their baseline point, and then the curriculum proceeds step by step through the steps that children with typical development show. Now, until a few years ago, it was really good. When people would say, how do you know children with autism are going to follow a typical sequence, that was a really good question because we didn't have any data for it. Developmentalists wanted to believe it, but we didn't have good data for it. But we now do have actually excellent data that shows that children with autism do, in fact, follow typical developmental progressions in many areas. Um, Dr. Helen Tagger Flussberg has documented this in speech and language development. We see that in children with autism, joint attention behavior leads into language just like it does in normal development. That imitation has very strong relationships with joint attention and language and symbolic play. We also have papers now that show that attachment behavior, the quality of relationship, predicts to intellectual development, language development, and play development in children with autism. So in fact, we do have plenty of studies now that demonstrate that children with autism, once they um, begin to learn and grow, do follow normal developmental sequences in the preschool period in intervention uh, studies and also in studies that don't involve intervention. So there is a good basis now for applying in an intervention. Um, you know, I'm going to skip through this, Lori, and then we're going to come back to these things, I think. So the child is assessed, and the set of developmental objectives are determined. And then the, the curriculum is developed. And we're using the kind of techniques you just saw Lori use with that little boy. And the, the frame of the teaching isn't the skill. It isn't that we're teaching a skill. The frame of the teaching occurs in what we call a joint activity routine. It's a play activity with the material. and so. The therapy, the therapy session goes from joint activity to joint activity to joint activity, not skill to skill to skill. The skills are built inside the activity. And when you just saw Lori with that little boy Mikey, the joint activity was the checker game. They're both playing this game of putting the checkers in the slots. But if you were watching, Lori did about four different objectives in that routine. Did anybody see any of the objectives she was working on? What did you see her working on? She worked on eye contact. She worked on the receptive instructions, give me. What else? She worked on turn taking. What else? She worked on colors. What else? Expressive language, uh, uh, initiating and producing some phonemes. Checker, black. He said something else, too. I can't remember what. Uh -huh. What else? Did you see her pointing? She was working. There's an objective written on his sheet that follows a point. So you saw her deliver six different lessons in that three minutes of play. That's how this therapy works. The play is the structure. The objectives are in the therapist's head, and they're very carefully task analyzed. And any opportunity that's there is where it goes. And she's moving quickly from thing to thing to thing. Why does that happen? Why do, why do we do that? Why are we moving around so fast? We're following the, file, following the child's lead, and what else is it doing for the child? It keeps things interesting. Uh, they're not stuck. It's not repetitive. Also, you know in how a discrete trial, eventually they just kind of get it, and they do it again and again and again, and you don't know if they really understand it? When you're moving around like this, and you come back to it, and you give the instruction again, and the child produces it, you know they're really responding to the antecedent and not just to the fact I've done this eight times, I've gotten reinforced each time, I'm going to take my chances that number nine is going to be the same thing. So, but I hope you also saw the that, that this actually breaks down into an ABC sequence. In everything she taught, there was an antecedent. It was, do you want red or blue? Put it here. Give it to me. Um, she waited for looks. Used his name. There's always an antecedent. There was a behavior or a prompt. And there was always a consequence. The consequence was what? The checker, putting it in, getting it. I loved, she also worked on joint attention. When she had him show her, give it to me, and she gave it right back, giving it back was the reinforcer. So there's a very careful use of reinforcement in this. It, you can analyze every interaction as the ABC. You can all see it happening. But it looks different. And we have a child who's initiating the activity and is um, very available for learning because we're right there in what he's interested in. 
So uh, you probably also saw a very positive affect between the child and the adult, this kind of lively, interested interaction. The child smiling, looking right at her, orients his body straight to her. There's, nobody's telling him how to sit or how to position his body. He's there. He wants to do it. And she's capturing. She steps inside that interest, and she joins him in it. And so she can create the, the teaching because she's now part of the activity. And she becomes part of the activity by taking the materials, handing them over, having the checkers. She inserts herself into it and then becomes a very powerful teaching agent. So it, that was the nice example of how this therapy works. Okay, there are two kinds of activity routines we use. One of them involves objects, that's what you just saw, and the other involves play without objects, which we call sensory social routines, and which are a really, really important part of building up the affective and communication exchanges. And um, sensory social routines are something we've done in Denver Model for about 20 years. You, pro you might recognize them in uh, RDI or in floor time as those kinds of play activities where the focus of, of the play is on the partner. And the whole thing is about creating a lively, fun, interpersonal social exchange in which we embed all kinds of language and communication and social goals, but in which the attention's on the person, not the object. So in, in this kind of therapy, the therapist goes back and forth between object, joint activities, and sensory social routines. And the object activities, we're highlighting cognitive, fine motor, gross motor, perceptual motor skills. In the sensory social routines, we're highlighting affect, joint attention, nonverbal communication, communication, and games. Okay, so we have two studies we're gonna tell you about now. I'm gonna, you know, um, I'm gonna pass this back to Lori. No, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna pass this back to Lori. She just gave me a good nonverbal cue that said finish. So I'm gonna finish, um, hold on a second here. Where's our, she's going to talk with you about that study. I'm going to talk with you. I'm going to finish off my part. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the study that's going on in Seattle, which we're really excited about. This is an RCT. It involved, it's a huge study. It involves 48 children who are randomized into treatment or non-treatment. We're using the Early Start Denver model delivered intensively 25 hours a week in children's homes, one-to-one -one for two years. Um, so the parents get ongoing training in the techniques and uh, the, pro the intervention project supplies the therapist. The children are 18 to 30 months old at the beginning of treatment. We follow them for 24 uh, and deliver care uh, for the children who are in the experimental group for 24 months. The children who are in the control group are followed. The children are assessed every 12 months on a wide variety of measures including brain-based measures, because we really, we believe that intervention changes brain function. Um, and we want to document that. And I, um, so we have a variety of EEG and structural MRI measures in that study to look for brain-based re responses uh, from intensive early intervention, the children who get it. Uh, the children are getting one-to-one -one intervention by our trained staff in the homes 20 hours a week. The parents deliver another five to 10 hours a week. And then the children get whatever interventions their families want them to get. So that our goal is for the children to be getting 30 to 35 hours across whatever they're getting with at least 25 hours of our model. And they are all getting that. We document that every single week. There's ongoing supervision and ongoing uh, fidelity measurement. The children all have objectives like we talk, just talked with you about, 12-week objectives. The objectives are defining what people are doing. Um, uh, we collect data in this. This is a good, good question that some of you might raise. It's like, how do you collect data in this? How can, how can anybody who's doing these ongoing things keep data? And you didn't see Lori sitting there with any data sheet. You can't. You can't keep trial-by-trial trial data in this kind of approach. We, what we do is uh, we essentially time sample every 15 minutes in the, the home-based program, we stop the, the child has something to do, we just stop interacting for a few minutes. We have a data sheet, and we don't keep trial by trial data, we actually keep interval data. In the la we score every objective, in the last 15 minutes, what did we see? Was it there or not? And so in a two hour period, we can collect nine data points on every objective. And this is sufficient for making decisions. You know, nine data points, give, I think, gives you as much information as 40. 
you can still establish what percent success you have. And we can still maintain the same kind of rule that we, we change skills, move to the next step after three consecutive periods of, I think it's 85% or better performance. You can get that kind of data out of this kind of data set. And so that's how, it took us a long time to figure out how to do the data system. But we do have, we figured out a way to do it and it works, it's very fast. Um, and it's not, it doesn't interrupt the therapy, it gives the children, it takes less than two minutes to complete a data sheet. And uh, we have good reliability, we've checked reliability on the data sheets in an ongoing way. So it drives the program well and it has helped us figure out how to do data in a relationship-based, um, play-based therapy. One other thing that, that we're kind of proud of in this that I want to talk with you about is how it's individualization. We all know that no one therapy approach is right for every child, and you have to individualize if you want the best progress you can get. But individualization then takes you away from a manualized treatment, and as soon as you start individualizing, you're no longer delivering the treatment that's in the manual. So how do you deal with that? The way that we, we figured out how to deal with this was to create what we call a decision tree. And so the decision tree is based, this is an example of um, the first half of the decision tree, which is how do you decide um, what level of naturalistic or didactic teaching to use? Um, and it depends on whether there's an intrinsic reinforcer or not. But the other part that I'm gonna start talk about is how do, we, how do we adapt the model? All children start in a naturalistic delivery, which is very carefully defined and we have good fidelity measures for. But we have a, uh, we require that the child be making measurable progress within three therapy sessions on an objective in order to stay in that teaching approach. And if they're not making measurable uh, progress within three teaching sessions, we then start to step, kind of step the behavior down. We start to make a set of changes to get to that standard. But it's lawful. There's a particular uh, kind of set series of steps that you follow, and that's the same for every child. So we've managed to figure out how to use a process that allows us to be, go all the way from the most loose play-based therapy you can imagine to the most structured mass trial delivered therapy you can imagine. Um, and every step in that way is basically behaviorally defined. And there's a specific criteria for when you make a movement to the next step and how long you stay there before you start back. So in doing this, we, f we figured out the piece, I think, that had stopped us for so long in this dilemma of wanting to be in to individualize and yet to try to, to um, have a manual-based treatment. Okay, um, let's see. We are running out of time. I'm not going to show you this video right now. If we want to, we can go back to this. But I think I want to show you one little video of a, a very young child. I just told you that the, this, this study is 18 to 30 month old. And we have now started to try to work with even younger children. And we haven't known what it would be like, but we've now worked with two little ones who are younger than 18 months at the beginning of this. And I wanted to show you a video of one of these children uh, so that you could see what it's like. It actually is working quite well. This little guy, okay, let me tell you what his objectives are. I think he's 17 or 18 months old at the time this video was taken. This is about his, this is a once weekly session where the parents are carrying out the therapy at home. His objectives are he's nonverbal, he doesn't have any gestures, he doesn't produce, he produces very little vocalization and no imitative vocalization. He doesn't imitate any body movements. Um, he has poor eye contact and he doesn't play reciprocally. So those are some of the main objectives that I'm working from in this little segment. And I'll kind of, I think I'll let you see it, then I'll talk you through it, and then Lori will tell you something about the um, parent-based oh. project we're talking about. And the shovel. Logan's got balls. Ball. Ready for ball? Here it comes. Whee! Ball. Ball. Whee! Okay, so there's an imitation. Here comes ball. Ball. 
Throwing a ball is one of his fine motor objectives. There's a little bit of a reach, so there's a little bit of a gesture. He just made a little sound. Now what's going to happen here is he's going to start to invent a natural gesture. I want you to watch it happen. There it is. And of course he doesn't know that that's a gesture, but I'm going to start to put meaning to that and see if I can get that to come back. And there it is again. So I'm going to try to shape that. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you saw the affective quality again. At the beginning of that this clip, he's pretty flat. He's not really looking at anything, he's kind of sitting there, but we get that energy up and then he's there and he's available for learning, following his lead, doing many different we worked on fine motor objectives in there. Uh, we've got production of sound, we've got imitation, we've got natural gestures, so you and we've got turn taking going on. So uh, you've got C5 different objectives being worked on in about a minute and a half. And the child easily moves from one to another. And you see learning on the spot. You see him evolve this gesture and learn what this game is all about. And it's all happening there. I, I don't know, there may be 12 behaviors in that. We've counted, actually. We actually get a behavior about every 10 seconds in this therapy. So six learning trials per minute in this therapy, which is probably pretty close to what you get in a discrete trial format. But we don't have any breaks here. We don't need breaks because the kids are, I mean, it has this natural ebb and flow of activity. So we can keep this rate going for two solid hours. Um, it's easier on the kids than it is on us. OK, so Lori's now <laughs> going to talk with you about the parent training um, project that she's doing right now as part of her postdoc. OK. Uh, doo, 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 doo. All right. Okay, so the, the current uh, study that we're piloting here then is this, uh, the application of the Early Start Denver model, but adding to that this parent training component. Um, and it's, the goal is to provide parents with the support and, well, number one, to provide them with the effective tools they need to elicit a variety of different social communicative behaviors. Uh, we want the parents walking away feeling like they're the therapists. It's not, you know, the fate of their children's lives are not in professionals' hands, they're, they're in the parents. It's, we want them to be active participants, to feel and to view themselves as critical members of their child's educational team. Um, so to see themselves as the teacher. And also for them to, to experience that moment, you know, when the child learns that skill, when they develop a new behavior, um, that their children are capable of being effective, intentional, and meaningful communicators. So we really want them to feel empowered. Uh, the, so the current project then is that parents uh, with their, uh, their children that have actually just been recently diagnosed, we're really trying to recruit families where they, they're, uh, they, they've just received that news, their child has autism and to bring them into our intervention program. And they receive 12 weeks, well, they come here for 12 concurrent weeks um, here at the clinic. The first two sessions out of those uh, 12 sessions are for assessments. That's when we're using that, the Early Start Denver curriculum tool so that we can assess the child across all areas of development, figure out what their areas of strengths are, but also their areas of need, and then write objectives that we're gonna target of, over the remaining 10 intervention sessions. Uh, we also have four follow-up visits that are spaced across a couple weeks apart so that intervention doesn't just end immediately, but we can gradually fade out and continue to meet the family's needs as they begin um, their in-home program. So this is not meant to be a permanent intervention program. It's meant to be something that families can have access to immediately after the child's diagnosed while their in-home program is starting, or while they're waiting for their in-home program to, um, to develop. In addition then to the curriculum that Sally showed you uh, targeting the child's um, developmental skills, we also have this parent training manual 
uh, which is helping to helping to guide us in terms of the teaching strategies we want we want the parents to walk away with knowing. So as I mentioned, the first two sessions then are really aimed at evaluating. Um, uh, the child's skills, writing the objectives, um, understanding what the parents needs are, what they want to walk away with understanding and knowing and providing their child. And then we start into a lesson. So each week there's a theme, a concept that we want the parents to understand how to, to use in these play in, in developing these play interactions with their children. So for example, the first lesson is on how to capture and hold your child's attention. How to get them even to look at you when you're trying to set up this play activity, how to sustain their, uh, their motivation, how to do turn taking, etc. All of the lessons really build nicely onto one another. But we also remember that each child, each family is unique and that some Sometimes we might need to skip around a little bit depending on where the child's at or which, um, you know, what, what issues we're dealing with. So a typical intervention session looks like this. The family comes in, the first five to 10 minutes are spent reviewing what's happened um, at home for the, the prior week. You know, what, um, what inter out of the different play uh, episodes the family was setting up with their child, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, we also want feedback from the family too in terms of the, the way that we're teaching them, um, the skills that we're wanting them to walk away with. So we, really, we, so we spend the first five to ten minutes just kind of catching up and seeing you know, what's, what's been going on at home. The next um, about ten minutes we ask the parent to play with the child and this is where we're looking, where we're taking a lot of our data from as well in terms of the uh, child's progression of skills across those different developmental areas as well as the parent's ability to continue using those teaching strategies. If there's any area that we see room for improvement, we're then going to take that time to kind of to, to improve the parent's skills, to touch up a little bit on whatever the prior week um, lesson was for that concept. We then discuss, discuss the new teaching concept with the parent where the therapist demonstrates that with the child. So just like you saw the video clip of me on the floor, that's what we would do, discussing whatever the new teaching strategy is for that week. And then um, we then gradually transition the parent into that play activity so they have a chance to practice that, that new concept while the therapist is giving them some feedback and coaching them along the way. Uh, again, we want the parent, we want that, the session to end with the parent feeling like they can continue that teaching strategy for the remaining week at home. Uh, we review the objectives, again, how to use that teaching strategy to continue targeting different areas of functioning for the child, and then say our goodbyes. Uh, the children, basically what I, the, the children that we currently have in the study, they're, um, they're four toddlers with autism. Their, um, their age at the beginning of intervention was around 26 months of, of, um, of age. And similar to Mikey, the, uh, all four, four children were nonverbal, um, no joint attention skills, imitation, uh, extremely active and avoidant. Uh, you'd even just try to hand them a toy and they you know, were under the table. So, <laughs> so no really very limited play skills. Uh, I don't know if we have time to go through the data. What we're, what we're tracking, okay. The, the data that we're tracking across the, um, the 12 weeks of, of intervention sessions and during that follow-up phase consist of the child's use of spontaneous communication. So this, these are the number of spontaneous words the child's using um, during baseline here, which again means before intervention is started, we see very low levels for all four children. They're color-coded here. And then this line indicates when intervention starts, and we see increases um, compared to their baseline levels. And at the present, only two children um, have completed the follow-up phase. The um, remaining two are, are close to finishing, and so then we'll have data for them. But we see that they're using these words, again, in a spontaneous way. It's not dependent on the adult saying, say ball, say train. They're using it in their own meaningful um, and functional way. Similar uh, presentation here for the child's ability to imitate words, to imitate behaviors or, and actions they, they see um, us doing with objects. So for example, Sally threw the ball, the little boy picked up, picked up the ball and he threw it himself. Um, also gestures, um, pointing, showing, blowing kisses, waving bye-bye, all those. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Oh yes, thank you. What We're tracking the behaviors then across play activities with the parent in this top panel here and then also play activities with the therapist because we really want to see, we want to get a, a, a global kind of representative view of the child's ability ac across um, each session here. So there's two play samples. Yeah. Yeah, and so the point is, is that, and again, yeah, that's actually a very good point, is that it's not this therapist who's the professional who's getting such great behaviors, it's the parent. They know their child the best, yeah. and this is what we want to see. We want the parents being more successful. Yeah, it's true in everything. 
Uh, this attentiveness, this is looking at the child's ability to stay with the activity, to participate, to be interested, to cooperate with the, with, you know, with the adult and what, um, in, in completing the activity together. And it's measured as to whether the child's showing high levels of attentiveness, moderate levels, or low levels. Again, with the parent and then with the therapist. Um, same outline for initiation, so now that social sharing component, how often is the child wanting to share the experience of the object or the activity uh, or the event with the parent? So it's not so much just about completing the activity, but you know, looking up at the parent and saying, do you see what I'm doing? Like, praise me, give me a high five, clap for me. Uh, and then lastly, looking at the parent's fidelity level, meaning their level of mastery of using the teaching techniques. So we want them to be, what we consider a mastery level is having them perform these teaching strategies at least at an 85% level, if not above. And that's what that dotted line indicates. So above that line means that the parents are using these techniques consistently, um, uh, regularly with their child, and that they're just as effective as a therapist. All right. Uh, very quickly, these are the developmental objectives that we write for the children uh, based on that curriculum. And the idea here, well, what we're seeing here is that for um, the children, these first three children that have actually finished the interve interve finished intervention, that they were between 73, to, they mastered 73 to 93 percent of their objectives. And then for the two children who have um, finished follow-up, they uh, completed those remaining objectives. I mean, right, like 15 to 18 yeah. objectives. This is not three objectives. This is 15 objectives taught in a 12-week period, where they're only getting one hour, one hour of therapy a week with us. So this is a this is a lot of learning that's going on, and the parents are doing it. And there's no instruction for the parents to do this many hours or do it this. We don't. This is just this is how this is how your baby plays. So the parents themselves are using these techniques when they want to, where they want to. There's no expectation from us of any particular number of hours and no requirement. Parents do tell us what, and they estimate for us. But So this is really the parents themselves incorporating these techniques into their ongoing play and feeding routines with their children and learning how to stimulate development. Okay. So, upcoming projects? Okay, yeah, so the final thing, we just wanted to tell you kind of what's ahead. At this point, we have planned a couple of new studies that, that we are uh, hoping to be able to do. One of them involves a continuation of this parent training project, um, but, but going to very young children. We would really like to look, work at the level of prevention. Is it possible to prevent the full kind of development of autism if you can get to high-risk toddlers early enough? and, and um, to bring these skills along. So we are hoping to be able to do a parent training uh, study of 12 to 15 month olds. So um, if, we can, if we get permission to do this study, we'll be recruiting for infant siblings at 12 months, 12 to 15 months who have symptoms or very young children whose parents and physicians are concerned that they may be developing autism at 12 to 15 months. That's one study that we're hoping to do start soon. A second one is a, this intensive treatment of 20, 25 hours a week in home for 18 to 24 month olds. We're hoping to be able to do a multi-site uh, randomized controlled trial with a very large number of children so that we can start to look at what predicts outcomes, what predicts best outcomes, and what predicts which children will respond to this kind of treatment and which children weren't. Well, you know, we need to be, we need to start knowing ahead of time what the right treatment is for children so we don't want to spend a year or two figuring out that this is not the right treatment for children and, and have lost all that time. And several other groups are working on this as well, but hopefully in a few years we're going to have a kind of a screening procedure where we can look at a profile of a young child and say, you know, this profile says that um, uh, mass trial work or low loss technique is probably the best treatment right now. And this profile says that this child should be in a much more child-centered, language-enriched program so that we can start off and um, kind of begin with the therapies that seem to be fitted best. But we don't know right now what, what those profiles are. The work has just begun on that. So we're hoping we need a large sample of children to figure that out from. So we're hoping we can do a large sample, a multi-site study that will help us try to figure that out. And the last project that we are in the midst of planning, this one is actually funded. It is funded, but um, we, we are still doing the, the 
IRB process for it, getting approval for it. But this is an effectiveness study, but you want to see whether we can teach other community sites to do this parent training project just through the materials that we generate. Uh, through CDs, the manuals, the written materials, and the videotapes, and all the, and the tools that we have, the fidelity tools and all of that, can another site with sophisticated therapists just pick up these materials and, f and implement the treatment, teach parents the skills, and bring about these changes in children. So in the next few months, we'll be looking for uh, community sites who would be interested in doing this and um, working with us to see this is an effectiveness study. There are very few of these that go on in the intervention world, but this is what we all need. We need to know not just how can we develop these great treatments that a lab-based group can carry out, but how do we get them to, I always use Kansas as my example, how do we get them to small towns in Kansas? How do those teachers figure out what to do? And it isn't going to be through workshops. It's going to be by buying manuals and getting CDs out there. So we would like to see whether we can create a kind of package that people can pick up and use. That's the third, our third goal of intervention studies over the next few years. So um, now it's your chance to ask us questions or tell us what you think we should be doing or whether you see ways we could be doing things better. We're very interested in feedback from you. Yes. Is my mic still on? No. No? Okay. There it is. Now my mic is on. Yes? Yeah? How do you become one of your community sites? <laughs> uh, well, you talked to us. <laughs> okay. Just talk. We just need to know some people that would be willing and interested. Do you want me to sign up? Uh, yes, we have some sign-up sheets in the back, actually. Yeah. In case you're interested in, in any of these studies that may be unfolding in the next few months, feel free to put your name down, and uh, we'll contact you about them as something, as, as a study becomes, you know, there's many processes. It's got to get funded. You've got to get approved by the IRB. So we're bringing all these through. But as something is, is funded and approved, then we have to find people to start with. So if you want to let us know about you and what you might be interested in, we're happy then as soon as we have something that's at the point where we can start recruiting people to contact you. Yes? I was wondering how you decide how long to advise families to stay in one model before they're not showing progress. Because I think what I've heard from your research is it's better to stick with one model than an eclectic approach of a bunch of different models at the same time. So, so how do you advise them to make a switch if we're not making progress? Mm -hmm. Well, in my own work, you see, I've got this three-day rule that I want to see progress in three days on a new program or I'm going to start messing with the program to get it. Um, if children are going to learn, they learn, they show you quickly if they're going to get something, is my experience. So I, um, it's a hard question because there's a lot, you know, Lots of programs don't work the first time you do it, the first time you design it and try it. And it does take fiddling around and fiddling around with the interventions with a new child to figure out what the right formula is. But I don't know, there's some real experienced therapists in the group. I would think in three months or so, we should know if a child is going to be making some progress in a new approach. What do all the rest of you think? What do you think, Elise? <laughs> I don't know. I guess I'd want to see something positive happening in three months or really, uh, really talk with the team about what are we going to do here. I mean, some children are very, very, very slow learners, but even very slow learners should be making some measurable gains if the programs are written correctly and the steps are fine enough. Yeah, it has, I think, a lot to do with the developmental levels that you were talking about before. If you're really targeting the appropriate developmental level where they really are, like the pre-acquisition mm -hmm. skills they need for an identified deficit, mm -hmm. then if you've really got that identified correctly and you've really got appropriate motivation, then you should be able to see if that particular technique is Yeah, if the step is right, the child is motivated, and you've got the pieces going, we should see progress, in little bits of progress in a week on a program. Yes. Um, I'm a first five commissioner for Solano County. And you know, if you're looking for funding, besides hitting the uh, state organization, you can go to the local communities that perhaps you're going to have these outside communities in. There's money you know, for parent training, et cetera, at most first fives. Also, with the new mental health funds that we have, you know, if you've got the parent interacting and doing this at home, it's going to 
hit some of their mental health goals. So there is some money out there. Thank you very much. This is where it's a problem to not to be new to California because you don't know yeah. all the, it's hard to figure out all the resources. So um, can I have your card at the end? <laughs> It takes money to do these projects, as you know. These are intense, these are highly, uh, intensely staffed projects. It isn't just the staff you see, but it's also the people running the camera and the people who are back there scoring the tapes in order to produce the data. So these are not um, inexpensive well, projects. First, I would say even the local county ones is to collaborate. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Other questions? Yes. Well, I just find it amazing that, I mean, you've got four families, very young children, that the, the parents were very obviously accepting of the child's diagnosis because I, st I teach um, preschoolers. I get most of the children when they just turn three into a school-based program. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have parents that are just so in denial that they won't even buy into any of my suggestions and mm -hmm. use them. At home. She's talking about um, parents, ex um, how long it takes a parent from the point that they get a diagnosis to be ready to move into intervention. And, and it's different for every family. There, there is something, I think, there's a timing issue here. And being able to say, you know, here's the diagnosis, this is what it means, we can start intervention next week, come back. There's a little window of panic in there which is partly what we're trying to cap, cap, um, work inside in this project. Because people do get very sad and it gets very scary and energy can, can go away for a long time, I think. But right at the beginning of this, there is this kind of, I think, fear, worry, and tremendous amount of energy for, I want to help this child, I want to lick this, I want to do something different. And to be able to do an intervention that follows you know, this week you come for your diagnostic visit, next week treatment starts. That's, uh, I think, a mobilizing way, a way to mobilize anxiety and worry and fear and grief into something productive. And then once you see children moving, you know, that's a tremendous thing. And for these little children, we a couple of them, they have been there right from diagnosis. And the first visit was a very sad visit all the way around. And then um, the parents come back the next week and they're like, we have to show you what he learned. You know, they walk in the door and it's just amazing. So there's a, you know, to be able to see that, yes, there is a diagnosis here, but the, these children can learn. They can grow, they can learn, parents can teach. It can go so much better. Um, that's, that's what we're trying to create. And I also want to say this, this, these families, um, there are uh, married families in this sample and there are single parent families and there are a wide range of SES and a wide range of ethnicity in this. So this is, um, the, our, these four families represent our population. It's not a homogeneous group by any means. And um, it's, we've had, I mean, the room is usually full of family members. It's grandma, and dad, or grandpa, or whoever. It's really, it's fun. So we haven't yet had an experience of, you know, this is only going to work for this parents where there's a family member at home or the child at home with mom or where there's a sufficient funding to get a sitter for the other kids. I'm sure that there are plenty of dilemmas that are going to make it hard for some families to mobilize this, but we've had a nice representative range of families and this, we've found that this works well. We've had bilingual children and bilingual families and Spanish-speaking families in the room. And um, so those, those children have done well. So, yes. I was going to say your timing I don't think could be any better than what it is right now. We, some of us just participated in a press conference with Jack O'Connell. He released the infant toddler guidelines for best practices for typically developing children in the state of California, which is relationship-based and family-centered. And they're finding that these practices we know are best for typically developing. And here you have research now that's showing that it also is just as effective for children with autism which really backs, you know, programs like PITC and West Ed, who've also launched all this material on mm -hmm. relationship-based, family-centered, brings about best practices yeah. for all children. Yeah, it's very nice when autism work can line up into developmentally appropriate practices mm -hmm. and when we can see that there are ways in which, you know, certainly children with autism need special aspects of the environment. They need intensive teaching, they need organization to their curriculum, but see that the value systems and the philosophies and the overall goals can be similar for children with autism and children with typical development of the same age, opens up a lot of different teaching environments. Um, and
And speaking of which, the other, my other dream project, which I don't have a proposal planned for yet, but I'm always looking for it, is a site that would love to do an inclusive activity. Because I've had the chance to do that in Colorado, to do this kind of work with young children with autism in preschools that were school-based preschools where most of the children had typical development. Those children did really well, and it was so much fun to do. And I would, I would love for us to develop some model inclusive environments around here so that we can ha have a chance to see how does it look, how can it look, so that we can have more, you know, a wider range continuum of services for young children with autism. It can't, inclusive education can be incredibly effective. You can get hundreds of trials in a day in this kind of therapy in an inclusive preschool. It takes a lot of work all the way around, but it also, it works real well. Gail McGee in Emory has been doing only group-based intervention for young children with autism for years using incidental teaching. Her data are, are strong, her kids look wonderful, um, and it's all inside an inclusive daycare setting for typical children with the kind of staffing that you need and the careful delivery that you need for children with autism. The children in the group doing what the group is doing, getting their curriculum inside what the other children are doing. It's a gorgeous thing to see when you can see that happen. We've been doing it for years there at Sac State at the Children's Center. We've been to, and actually, with some of the studies we've been trying to send children here, I've suggested to Dahlia that the researchers should really be coming to the centers and, and trying to get the clients there and gathering the material there versus always trying to have the children come here. Right. Okay. We, we know. Mm -hmm. We just need some partners. We don't have any partners yet. Maybe we'll have some now. Yeah. We drove here this uh, evening from the Central Valley of California. Really excited to hear about the therapeutic interventions that you're doing. Something that we're struggling with is actually identifying those children. Uh, I work with them at ages three to five, but most of my families report that they knew something around mm -hmm. 12 months. That's they right. average 18 to 24 months before they get the diagnosis, and they're very frustrated by that time. Do you have any strategies for getting information into the hands of parents who might drive that process, or into the hands of pediatricians who might begin to identify? <coughs> um, early diagnosis? Part? The issues around early screening and diagnosis? Yeah. That? You know, that's a whole other talk. That's what I I know. Well, I'm sorry. It's a little tricky. We don't have good tools right now for under 24 months. It's a, um, the tools that we have don't aren't tuned to that age group. And there are just some new tools coming out now, but they're just in the beginning of practice. I mean, we're going to be trying some of these, some of these tools out in these other projects. But our measures are not kind of where we need them to be right now. We know we can find, we know what, how the children look, we can study them, we can report them, but our standardized tools aren't great at capturing them yet. There are a couple of screening tools. One's called the ESAT, Early Screening for Autism in Toddlers, it must be. It's a Dutch tool, it was just published two months ago. There's the MCHAT, which you probably know about, which is one of the better ones. And there's a new AOSI, Autism Observational Scale, must be for infants, which is a Canadian tool being used by um, Susan Bryce and Lonnie Zweigenbaum. It's a test that you give, essentially. It's kind of like a baby ADOS, but it's an under 12 month ADOS. And we're just, the research is just coming in on how discriminating it is. I mean, the, the science is like right here, right now. We're all doing those studies to try to develop the instruments that you need to find these kids. I know it's really hard. In a lot of ways, I just read an article that said the best baby screener for autism we have right now is just a screen, a language screen. And that we probably have a better hit rate of using something like the ages and stages at a pediatrician's office, finding the kids who are behind, and then getting those kids seen by a special team. We can probably identify more children with autism that way then by have, using our special tools for autism, which aren't tuned to the, that age level yet. So are pediatricians up here using the ages and stages? No. Not the system No. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are several tools that are doing it, and they're usually funded by their local first five. They've got trained uh, paramedical people that go out and do this in the lobby before the child goes in to see the pediatrician. They're doing it down in uh, the Modesto County area. 
and they have a one door entry for children zero to five and their first five has funded that. Wow. Thank you. That's great. Great. Yes. In um, Sacramento County here for the early Head Start program that we have we use the ages and stages screener and there's also a social emotional screener now too that we're implementing. Great. We need a little workshop just on this issue for professional <coughs> John Brown's still in this room? Yes. Yes. Yes, he is still in this room. John Brown, wherever you are. <laughs> there he is. There he is. I think we need a, we need a work, community workshop on screening, early screening. And Sally Osnott and I will definitely come and, and give a talk in the next, by summer. We'll, we'll bring with you our, our, our work on this and our, with our colleagues. Because this is a real, there are eight studies across the world going on on these SIVs. And ours is the only one that started at one month. And we're all watching these babies grow up, and we're learning a ton from them. And what we're learning is that autism looks all different kinds of ways in, across that period of time. And um, there isn't one autism profile. And it probably is going to be this broader screen um, that's going to help us identify the kids, and then really watching for a long time, following them and treating them but um, for their symptoms and then kind of seeing how it all shakes out um, over time. Yes? Is your PowerPoint available or will it be available? It, uh, he's making, Dan is making a video of this which will be available where, Dan, on the web? And also in our resource room. Yes? I have a bit of a clinical question. Um, I use a lot of naturalistic and developmental approaches in the in programs that I use. And what? And the in-home programs that I oversee, which are actually overseen by Lisa. Um, <laughs> and um, one of the things that we often run into as a difficulty in that environment is that we're coming in as outsiders. And even if our bag of tricks is amazingly cool, these kids are in their own environments. So without the benefit of the clinic where you can structure the play activities by what's in the environment, how do you provide an overarching sort of macro level structure to play in the home mm -hmm. kids? The Seattle project is that they have, the kids have somebody in their house four hours a day, so two two-hour shifts. <coughs> in each, the families have to create some kind of therapy space somewhere. So in the kids' bedroom, you know, there's a little table, and we, we orchestrate these spaces. So there's like a book corner, and there's a beanbag corner, and there's a open gross motor plate pair area, and then there's a table and chairs. So we, ha we create that kind of space out of somewhere. And then the therapists come in uh, with a bag, big bag of toys, which gets changed every two weeks. Yeah, they, and they have to change their toys out every two weeks, so that so it has to stay fresh. And then they have a combination of the child's <coughs> toys and their own toys. But I think they, and there's a structure to it. They have to go, you know, there's a greeting routine. The, the hello and the goodbye routine are very set. And the parents are, are not necessarily, a lot of parents are not in the room at the time because they don't want to be the one do their dishes and stuff. <laughs> and, and there's just this structure of, uh, you know, active toy-based toy routine, sensory social routine, table, floor, move spaces, every joint activity routine. There's some requirements that are built into this, but it just kind of takes a structure of its own and the kids learn it. And they, um, they adapt to it in that space. We adapt the spaces as we can. And the routines that the therapists develop, starting with the hello and the goodbye and the table to floor, active to quiet, object to not, just develops a routine over time that the kids get. But there, it's because it's happening every day, every day of the week for two years that it happens. It is hard in the homes. Although, I, think, I don't know, I've done enough home visits that the kids learn routines around the toys. Yeah. And then they get, you get a, kind of a structure from the materials. But it takes a while. Okay. Other questions? Well, you've been a great audience. Thank you so much for coming out. UC Davis Mind Institute began in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, learning disabilities, and other brain disorders is helping children achieve their fullest potential. 
please call or visit our website to find out more about current studies, our research team, and upcoming events.